Unit 5. Education of children with physical and health-related problems in inclusive classrooms. Introduction. Dear learners, this unit centers on the developmental deviations of children with motor-slash-physical and health-related problems. Identification and assessment procedures undertaken in the education of these children. Elimination and minimization of social and environmental barriers that may hamper education of the physically impaired and with health-related problems, curriculum modifications and strategies in assisting these children in the inclusive classrooms. Unit Learning Outcomes After completion of this unit, student candidates develop skills and competences in Identify behavioral characteristics of children with physical or health-related problems and children at risk. Worth educational modifications to make classroom effective learning settings for children with physical or motor-related problems and at risk. Understand environmental and social barriers to the education of these children. Explore personal factors that may interfere with learners' educational needs. Activity What is the difference between physical disabilities and health impairments? It could be difficult for a physically disabled child to participate with other children or the family in recreational activities. What recreational activities might you suggest, for example, for a child in a wheelchair. Describe some inexpensive adaptations that an individual with physical disabilities might make to his or her clothing to make sitting in a wheelchair more comfortable. Describe five ways in to minimize the effects of a child's absences from school. 5.1 the developmental characteristics of children with physical and health-related problems. Activity. What are the developmental effects of seizure disorder in school-age children, specifically of adolescents in the high school? Can you imagine and pinpoint major types of physical or motor-related problems and its developmental characters? How can progressive health-related problems interfere with the child's educational, physical, social, cognitive, etc. development? Is there a difference between neurological defects and musculoskeletal problems? Mention at least three points supported with literature. Neurological impairments are problems with the structure or functioning of the central nervous system, including the brain and the spinal cord. The most common neurological disorders include seizure disorders, cerebral palsy, spina bifida and spinal cord defects, and traumatic brain injury. A convulsive disorders the word convulsion refers to a general seizure involving rapid spasmodic contraction and relaxation of the musculature. And epilepsy or convulsive disorder is the most common neurological impairment encountered in the school. It is a disorder in which the individual has a tendency to have recurrent seizure sudden, excessive, spontaneous, and abnormal discharge of neurons in the brain accompanied by alteration in motor function and or sensory function and or consciousness. The frequency of seizures may vary from a single isolated incident to hundreds in a day. Seizures may be caused by many conditions and circumstances and are divided into two primary epilepsies. Dash they usually appear at a young age, occur in families where there is some history of epilepsy. Secondary epilepsies, dash they may appear at any age, and result from accidents or child abuse, brain injury, meningitis, 
etc. B. Cerebral palsy is a disorder of movement in posture caused by a defect in the developing brain. It is frequently encountered in school children. The child with cerebral palsy is unable to fully control his or her movements or motor functions. Since cerebral palsy is the result of damage to certain areas of the brain too, it is not a disease. Rather, cerebral palsy is a condition that is non-progressive and non-infections. Once it is acquired, it can't be cured. Damage may occur before prenatally, during perinatally, or immediately after postnatally the childbirth. Occasionally, an individual will acquire cerebral palsy later in childhood. Acquired cerebral palsy is usually the result of brain damage resulting from accidents, brain infections, or child abuse. Many individuals with cerebral palsy have trouble with verbal and nonverbal communications. The disability makes it difficult for the child to control the muscles required for spoken language, often making speech both very difficult to produce and difficult or impossible to understand. Nonverbal communication that depends on facial expressions and body language may be difficult for other to read in an individual whose body is subject to uncontrolled movements. See spina bifida and spinal cord defects. Spina bifida is a developmental defect where the spinal column fails to close properly. The defect's seriousness depends on how high the defect is along the spinal column the closer to the neck, the more serious the impairment, and how much of the spinal cord material is involved in the damage. The causes of spinal canal defects are not yet clear, although the presence of a virus or an unknown environmental toxin during early fetal development and genetic factors have been suggested. The defect occurs very early in the development of a fetus, between the 20th and 30th day of fetal development, before a woman even knows she is pregnant. D. Traumatic Brain Injury Traumatic brain injury is severe trauma to the head, that results in lingering physical and cognitive impairments. Individuals who have traumatic brain injury can require many years of work to relearn simple tasks. Fortunately, advances in medical technology are making recovery possible in some cases. The term traumatic brain injury does not apply to brain injuries that are congenital or degenerative, or brain injuries induced by birth trauma. Rather, it is acquired injury to the brain caused by an external physical force, resulting in total or partial functional disability or psychological impairment, or both, that adversely affects a child's educational performance. Thus, the term applies to open or closed head injuries resulting in impairments in one or more areas of these cognition, abstract thinking, language, problem-solving, memory, sensory, attention reasoning, speech, judgment, perceptual and motor abilities, psychosocial behavior, physical functions, information processing, Children with neuromuscular diseases. Polio. Dash polio is a muscular disease in which poliomyelitis, viral infection, attacks the nerve cells in the spinal cord that controls muscle function. The effects of polio infection range from symptoms resembling those of a cold and fever to mild to severe paralysis. 
In addition to the paralysis which ranges from mild to severe, the child may be subjected to upper respiratory infections due to improper muscle tones. Muscular dystrophy, dash it is a progressive muscle weakness that comes from problems in the muscles themselves. The muscle cells degenerate and are replaced by fat and fibrous cells. The cause of muscular dystrophy is unknown, but it appears to run in families, usually transmitted by the mother's genes. It mainly affects boys. Health-related impairments, although there are a number of conditions caused by diseases, the main conditions which forces children to face special problems within the category of health impairments include the following of infection, asthma, cytomegalovirus CMV, HIV infection, human immunodeficiency virus HIV is responsible for the deadly acquired immunodeficiency syndrome AIDS and can be communicated to a child by an infected mother. The effects of the infection in children include central nervous system CNS damage, additional infections, developmental delay, motor problems, psychosocial stresses, and death. To this effect, there must be a long-lasting treatment for children with HIV infection. The treatment includes medical care, education, and developmental services, or a combination of these things. Asthma, it difficulty in breathing, with wheezing sounds from the chest caused by air rushing through narrowed air presages. It is one common type of severe difficulty in breathing. A child with asthma usually has labored, wet breathing that is sometimes accompanied by shortness of breath and a cough. A combination of three events causes the wheezing, tightening of the muscles around the bronchial tubes, swelling of the tissues in the bronchial tubes, and an increase of secretions in bronchial tubes. Nonetheless, the basic causes of asthma are unknown. It is believed to be most frequently caused by an allergic reaction to certain substances in individuals who have a physical predisposition to asthma. When we see its prevalence, asthma is one of the most common chronic diseases of children, and the leading cause of school absence is among all the chronic diseases. Approximately, 6% of all children believe to have asthma. Cytomegalovirus CMV, it is a herpes virus infecting 1% of newborn each year. If a fetus contracts this virus, the infection may lead to brain damage, blindness, and hearing loss. CMV can be transmitted through bodily fluids, a vaccine is not yet available. It appears that pregnant women who work in child care settings may have an increased risk of infection. Prevention strategies include washing hands frequently, disposing of papers properly, keeping toys and play areas clean. 5.2 Identification and assessment of learners with physical and health-related problems. This section gives emphasis to identification and assessment procedures and techniques to be employed by teachers and other relevant professionals in the education of children with physical-slash-motor and health-related problems. Activity, classification, or identification of children with physical slash motor impairments and health related difficulties seems mandatory to plan for appropriate education. Do you agree with this idea? Forward your response with relevant evidence. Many of children with physical and health related problems are excluded from school. What is the reason in your opinion? 
as of different international conventions all children have the right to quality education. How do you reconcile the above activity question to with this viewpoint? The primary system affected and the factors that give rise to the condition could be ways of classifying children with physical disabilities and health impairments. These children, in general, show one or more of the following signs or characteristics limited vitality or energy, many school absences, the need for physical accommodation, to participate in school activities, poor motor coordination, frequent falls and speech difficulty to understand, etc. In a broad sense, all physical disabilities and health impairments may fall into three main categories or four one impairment of health and disease, two neurological impairments, and three musculoskeletal problems, four accident based impairments. Many children with physical impairment are excluded from school. Most schools remain physically inaccessible for children who depend on wheelchair, calipers and crutches for mobility. Children who experience difficulties with verbal or written communication due to their physical impairment are also often excluded from schooling or marginalized in school. It is therefore essential that we start making schools more accessible for children with motor slash physical impairment. According to numerous international conventions and agreements, all children have the right to access quality education in an inclusive or integrated setting in their home communities. 5.2.1 education of children with motor or physical problem in inclusive classroom. This subsection highlights on education of children with physical slash motor impairments giving attention to some areas of this problem. The teacher candidates and instructors are advised to expand the area depending on the time frame assigned for the course. Activity how can we help a child with seizure disorder in our respective schools? If a child has contracted any form of cerebral palsy, how can you assist him or her in the inclusive classroom? Is it possible to assist children with spinal cord problem in regular schooling? How do you help him or her? For your opinion state different types of CP with their effect on the child's education. Teachers should spend much time with the child during the waking hours and should provide important information to the child's physician on the characteristics of a child's seizure disorder. They can help the child and the child's physician by monitoring the effects and dosage of seizure medication Teachers should also be prepared to respond effectively to a child's seizure and to show other students and school personnel how to help a child experiencing a seizure. The use of appropriate teaching and testing techniques really matters for children with physical disabilities and health impairments. For children who cannot try it as fast, and efficiently as others, the teacher must anticipate accommodations. Example The child may need extra time for completing written assignments. The teacher may encourage classmates to take notes for students who cannot write, and she or he may arrange other facilities or adjustments. Students with uncontrollable jerky movements and other conditions may face difficulties in paper and pencil tests. Thus, sometimes a teacher may use oral tests in order to obtain accurate rating of the student's skill level. Teachers of paralyzed children with spinal cord defects need special training. For example, 
Some children with severe cerebral palsy may need the teacher to physically move them from place to place or position them. The physical therapist can instruct the teacher on the safest and most appropriate manner to transfer a particular child. Teachers of students with physical disabilities and health impairments must be prepared to work cooperatively with the other professionals, such as speech-language pathologists, physical therapists, counselors, and physicians participating in the child's education. They must also be able to adapt the child's schedule, since the child who needs to work with other professionals may have additional absence from school. 5.2.2 Education of children with health-related problems in the inclusive schooling. Under this subsection, you are going to deal with the education opportunities of children with variety of health-related problems in the regular classroom settings or other situations related to impairments and individual preferences get attention as well. Activity What are the common educational preferences of children with visual impairments? Most of the children with health-related problems are absent from class. How do you assist these children in the regular classrooms? How do you assist a child with asthma problem in your respective classes? Specifically referring to a child with seizure disorder, how can you assist a child if faces a problem in the classroom? Each child with physical disability or health impairment has individualized needs. Teachers can help students with physical disabilities and health impairment by adapting the learning environment to their needs. They also have a responsibility to such exceptional children to create a supportive atmosphere, one that fosters the child's acceptance by providing classmates with information about the student's condition. Thus, so as to help students with physical disabilities and health impairments Teachers need to learn many important things. How to assist a child with health care needs. How to deal with frequent absences. How to assist a child who is having a seizure. How to make scheduling accommodations. How to address special issues relating to paralysis. How to adapt the class activities. How to adapt teaching techniques how to promote social integration. Some of the above critical topics are discussed below briefly. Absences Children with physical disabilities and health impairments may often be absent from school because they need medical care or because they are too weak to come to school on certain days. For example, Asthma is one of the major causes of school absences. To help these children keep up with their classmates, schools should devise different techniques, such as providing home teachers, making videotapes of special classroom activities, and allowing classmates to take turns assigning as peer tutors after school. In doing these, it is possible not only to help the child with his or her academic progress, but also maintain a social connection to the teacher and the other students, so that the child feels more comfortable about returning to the classroom later. Treatment of the asthma can at least be done from two parties the student himself slash herself and the teacher. The student may require special precautions concerning the air in the classroom, frequent vacuuming, air filtration, and daily wiping of surfaces and restrictions on playing outdoors during bad weather, playing with classroom pets, eating certain foods, and handing certain teaching materials. 
teachers also must know what to do for the child during an asthma attack. Consultation with the student, the family, and the physician is necessary to monitor medications, to administer breathing treatment, and to plan procedures for assisting the child during an attack. 5.3 Assessment and elimination of social and environmental barriers in the inclusive schooling to facilitate learning. Under this section, teacher candidates get concept of environmental barriers that hinder education of children with physical and health-related impairments and the likelihoods of elimination of such challenges in the regular classroom settings. Activity what does socio-emotional adjustment mean? Can you mention major social, emotional, psychological and other related factors perceived as barriers to education of children with physical slash motor and health related impairments? Discuss in groups. Discuss in your groups on the methods slash techniques of minimizing the barriers to facilitate learning socio-emotional adjustment children with physical disabilities and health impairments sometimes feel powerless for reasons we can easily understood withdrawal and aggression could also be part of the atmosphere for these and other socio-emotional adjustment problems these children need support and help in order to accept and adjust to their handicapping conditions. It is evidenced in many lines of researches that people are more likely to accept their physical disabilities when the environment is supportive, when they achieve some sense of control over the handicapping conditions, and when they begin to demonstrate new competence teacher can enhance the socio-emotional adjustment of children with physical disabilities and health impairments in the following ways increasing the understanding of the handicapping conditions dash in cooperation with the child's parents the teachers should help the child and other students understand relevant aspects of the condition its cause treatments Prognosis and educational implications. Teachers should help students understand that a physical disability is merely an individual difference, not something to fear or ridicule or cause shame. They must be advised to respect the way they feel about handicapping conditions without condoning maladaptive behaviors such as teasing and name calling. School children have also been informed that incident CG epilepsy can occur at school. Emphasizing the quality of life. Teachers can help students adjust to physical handicaps by helping them to see their disabilities as just one aspect of their lives. Although children with physical disabilities must be allowed to talk about their limitations, they should also be encouraged to inventory their abilities, including the ability to help others. Increasing positive aspects of control. Although children with physical disabilities cannot control their physical handicaps, they can control many other aspects of their lives. So, these children should be helped in controlling some antisocial behaviors such as temper tantrums, frustrations, etc. 5.4 Individualized Educational Plan IP and Curriculum Modification to accommodate learning preference of children with physical and health related problems. The unit focuses on the usefulness of curriculum modification and preparation of IEP to assist education of children with physical and health-related problems in the inclusive settings. Additionally, the concept of making inclusive classrooms appropriate to accommodate all learners gets attention. 
activity, how can teachers help education of students with physical slash motor and health related problems in inclusive classroom? Sometimes children with physical impairments may wish slash need to use their own furniture in the classroom. Is it possible to do so? Why and how? Support your response with evidence. What is the major problem children with health impairments face, and possible IP you are required to prepare? Use examples. The use of appropriate teaching and testing techniques really matters for children with physical, or motor and health related impairments. For children who cannot write as fast, and efficiently as others, the teacher must anticipate accommodations. Students with uncontrollable jerky movements and other conditions may face difficulties in paper and pencil tests. Thus, sometimes a teacher may use oral tests in order to obtain accurate reading of the student's skill level. Teachers can help students with physical or motor and health related impairments by adapting the learning environment to their needs. They also have a responsibility to any exceptional child to create a supportive atmosphere, one that fosters the child's acceptance by providing classmates with information about the student's condition. Thus, if there are children with physical or motor and health related impairments in your classroom, take the following tips for good. Be alert to signs of fatigue in the child. Find teaching materials that can be adapted to the physical needs of the student. Make sure that all areas of the room and school are accessible. Make sure that materials, leisure activities are within the reach of the students. Include activities each day that the student can accomplish from a wheelchair. Arrange post-emergency instructions and telephone numbers. Classrooms and school facilities, libraries, toilets, sport grounds and play areas should be made physically accessible for all children. Children who use wheelchairs, calipers, or crutches for mobility may find it difficult moving around within a traditional classroom blocked by rows of chairs and desks. It is therefore important that we set up the classroom in such a way that all the children can move about freely. Children must not just have physical access to their own desk but also to other parts of the classroom for group activities, or just to fetch something from a shelf or cupboard, or to paste a drawing on the wall. Children who get easily tired, and need much rest, may find it difficult to come to school on time, or to stay in school the whole day. We should therefore repeat important information once or twice to make sure that all the children have heard it at least once. This will also benefit children with it, and children who may have had difficulties understanding the information the first time around. Children with physical impairments may sometimes wish slash need to use their own furniture, such as ergonomic chairs and sloped writing tables. This should be accommodated without being obtrusive for the other children. Specially designed furniture should, if possible, be made available for those who need chairs and tables that differ from standard classroom furniture. This does not have to be expensive. Chairs can be designed based on local models. Some children would be more comfortable standing rather than sitting down especially children with back injuries. This should be accommodated in the classroom. Settings that stage for inclusive schools. Oh teachers, teachers' attitudes towards students, 
are a major force in determining the nature of the interaction between teacher and students, and in turn, affect students' achievement. Teachers' attitudes also influence the attitudes of students without disabilities towards students with disabilities. Thus, teachers' attitudes should be the first area dealt with as preparations are made to place students with disabilities in regular classrooms. In service should include a. Getting to know individuals with disabilities b. Obtaining knowledge about specific disabilities and learning capabilities c. Identifying the roles of professional team members and planning for the use of available resources and d. Adapting materials and instructional methodologies to the needs of students with disabilities O special support personnel Special support personnel and regular teachers of students with disabilities need to be brought together to study and practice teamwork in the skills of collaboration systematically. O students without disabilities, research indicates that attitudes towards students with disabilities at both the elementary and secondary school levels are conflicting. However, the bulk of evidence indicates that students without disabilities tend to reject students with disabilities. This may be due to historical practices of segregation, fear of the unknown and negative attitudes, and behaviors displayed by school personnel towards students with disabilities. The importance of good role models with positive attitudes cannot be overstated. O planned interactive activities involving students with disabilities and their peers without disabilities are widely recognized as important factors in successful social integration within the mainstream environment. Preparation of students without disabilities includes increasing their knowledge and information about disabilities such as 1. Understanding the nature of the disabilities 2. Instructional units on disabilities 3. Simulation activities and 4. Structured interaction strategies O students with disabilities, teachers can prepare students with disabilities for the transition from the special to the regular classroom by identifying the new situations or environments, listing the activities that will be required in the new environment, specifying the skills needed to function properly, and identifying skills already mastered. 5.5 Assessment and Education of Children with Multiple Disabilities Culturally Diverse and Children at Risk in the Inclusive Classrooms This section deals with the underlying concepts of cultural diversity, at-risk children and the socially and environmentally deprived children. Since the main intent of this unit focuses on education of these children, it see details of factors that facilitate for cultural, social, and environmental deprivations, and at risk with the intervention techniques to be employed by relevant bodies like teachers, family and the community. Activity How do you perceive multiculturalism? its benefits and challenges in inclusive educational settings slash what are the major indicators that facilitate at risk situation on children how do you recognize the social and environmental deprivation did you ever find multiply impaired children in your vicinity or schools what possible strategies do you devise in assisting these children properly attend regular schooling with their peers. 
Is there any difference between the disadvantaged and at risk? Support your response with evidence. The culturally diverse groups and at risk children, increasingly, school enrollments are made up large numbers of students from different ethnic and culturally rich backgrounds, language, customs, beliefs, race, ethnicity, geographic location, income status, gender, and other culture-specific characteristics. Often culturally diverse students have special needs that can be met with some modifications in regular education programs. Issues for the culturally diverse children include a achievement of culturally diverse students typically lags behind that of white, mainstream students. b. Culturally and linguistically diverse students continue to be both underrepresented and overrepresented in special education. c. Culturally and linguistically diverse students are dropping out of school at a much higher rate than white students. Cultural pluralism means all members of society at large mutually respect cultural differences, and that these differences are fostered, encouraged, and celebrated. The term multiple impairment does not merely refer to any combination of two or more impairments. It can be determined as a combination of physical, sensory, and or cognitive impairments. that lead to severe interaction, communication, and learning difficulties. Deaf blindness is also considered to be multiple impairment. Deaf blindness, as one best example of multiple impairments, which is also known as dual sensory impairment, is more than just a combination of visual and hearing impairments. Deaf-blind people may not be totally deaf and totally blind. Many deaf-blind people have some remaining hearing and vision, while others have nearly complete loss of both senses. The following are helpful in assisting children with multiple impairments. Oh, the first step would be to find out how much residual hearing and or vision the child has, if any. If the child has residual vision and or hearing, we need to try to make use of it to create communication and encourage learning, development, and participation. We should attempt to invite and develop communication by offering our hands under the child's hands, instead of just shaping her slash his hands into formal signs. Signs may not yet have any meaning for her slash him. Oh, consider the appropriateness of formal tests. For example, a test that evaluates vocabulary would not be relevant to a child who is just learning how to sign or gesture simple events. According to the National Consortium on Deaf Blindness. Assessment of children who are deaf-blind must go far beyond the use of assessment instruments. Standardized tests may be necessary to qualify a child for services, but are inappropriate as tools to guide educational planning. Oh, observe the child in their everyday life. Watch their interaction with objects and people. and use a functionality scale to evaluate their abilities. O evaluate the effects of environmental factors, such as being in a strange environment, being with or without family, physical space and communication methods. O meet with guardians and teachers to assess the child's behavior. Question whether certain behaviors could be triggered by an activity or feeling that the child is struggling with. Often, adequate support is key to stopping this behavior. Oh, consider holding more than one assessment 
so you can get a feel for the child's usual behavior and ability. Children at risk, parents, policy makers, business leaders, and the general public increasingly recognize the importance of the first few years in the life of a child for promoting healthy physical, emotional, social, and intellectual development. Yet many children face deficiencies in the years leading up to school entry in terms of emotional support, intellectual stimulation, or access to resources due to low income, or other factors that can impede their ability to develop to their fullest potential. According to the finding of Labor and Population 2005, a substantial percentage of children are disadvantaged in terms of resources available for healthy physical and mental development. One-fifth of children under age six live in poverty, and nearly half of all children face one or more risk factors associated with gaps in school readiness. These disadvantages translate into shortfalls in academic achievement, pro-social behavior, educational attainment, and, eventually, greater rates of unemployment and criminality. Although most children experience a supportive home and neighborhood environment with access to sufficient financial and non-financial resources to support healthy development, many other children do not. A few indicators illustrate some of the resource disparities in early childhood Elias, 2009. Poverty has been shown to be particularly detrimental in early childhood in terms of children's subsequent educational and other life course outcomes. Research has demonstrated that neighborhoods of concentrated poverty typically defined as those with a poverty rate exceeding 20% provide more limited opportunities for young children in terms of social interaction, positive role models, and other resources, such as quality child care, health facilities, parks, and playgrounds that are important for healthy child development. Healthy child development is supported by regular access to health care, such as well child visits. These visits can provide opportunities for health care providers to conduct developmental screenings and to encourage parental behaviors that promote strong social, emotional, cognitive, and physical child development. Early home literacy building activities that are associated with better school performance in kindergarten and beyond include reading to a child regularly three or more times a week, teaching children letters, words, and numbers, and telling stories or teaching songs and music. Many children from disadvantaged backgrounds fail to meet grade-level expectations on core subjects. For example, national educational assessments at grades 8 and 12 show that about 50% of children from at-risk backgrounds e.g., low parental education or low family income score below the basic level of reading and math achievement indicating that they have less than partial mastery of the knowledge and skills fundamental for proficient work at that grade level. Other manifestations of problems in school achievement for disadvantaged children include higher rates of special education placement, grade repetition, and dropping out of school Stanley and Greenspan, 2012. These adverse outcomes during childhood and adulthood have consequences that extend beyond the lost potential near and long term for the affected children. These people's participation is poor in social welfare programs, 
and higher rates of crime and delinquency observed. The four keys to helping at-risk children, a caring sustained relationships. One of the shortcomings of our educational structure is that relationships with teachers, especially in secondary school, may be caring, but they are not easy to sustain. Yet at-risk youth need relationships that are both caring and stable. They need to build a sense of trust and have the time to communicate the complexity, frustrations, and positive aspects of their lives in and out of school. Only after creating a strong relational base will an adult have the platform to be a source of enduring and cherished advice to a student. Students won't confer trust to an adult based on his or her role as a counselor, psychologist, or social worker. We have to earn it by building a relationship. Be reachable goals. Students often have unrealistic career and personal goals based on what they learn from the mass culture. Kids see sensationalistic media portrayals of exceptionality as normative and, often, desirable and attainable. From the base of a caring relationship, we can help students form realistic and reachable career, personal, and educational goals. This does not imply that the goals are not challenging. The most motivating goals are those that are within our reach, if we exercise some effort. Only someone who knows a student well, and cares deeply about his or her well-being, will be able to help that student form reachable goals. See realistic, hopeful pathways. Students do not attain reachable goals on their own. Like any of us. Students are more likely to move ahead when they know that there is a path to get there. Imagine how useless MapQuest or similar services would be if they allowed you to enter the starting point and the destination, but did not give you a road map to travel from one to the other. So it is with students. They need adult help to create realistic pathways ideally with guardrails. They also need someone to reassure them that they have what the character education partnership. We must recognize the difficulty of trying a new path and both prepare students for obstacles and support them when they run into problems. This can be highly challenging as some of the students' erroneous actions will violate school rules or perhaps even legal boundaries. We must handle such cases individually and with discerning judgment, rather than with the kind of prescribed justice that lead to have the largest school dropout rates and, proportionately, the greatest prison population the engaging school and community settings. With all the talk about the importance of engagement, it's possible to lose sight of exactly what leads students to have a feeling of being engaged. The feeling of being engaged in a setting or group happens when students have opportunities to receive positive recognition and to make positive contributions can spend time in environments in which teamwork is encouraged and get help learning new skills that they find valuable and helpful in their lives. Engaging settings in the school and the community have logos, mottos, missions, and other tangible things that allow students to experience a sense of belonging and pride particularly for students who are in disadvantaged circumstances. Spending time in engaging settings both in school and after school is important. After school settings linked to the school as well as community programs 
such as boys and girls clumps, boy scouts and girls scouts, big brothers, big sisters, and faith-based youth groups provide more chances for students to build positive relationships with caring adults and potentially supportive peers. One unique feature of mentors in non-school settings is that they can often help students learn the rules of the game for success in school. Mentors in after-school and community settings are often better positioned to communicate clearly to students about the potential consequences of their actions and the behaviors that they need to change, and how to change them. Also, they can give feedback about how students are progressing, so they can operate in a spirit of improvement. Caring adults outside the formal school system often have a better understanding of students' lives outside of school, and can help them find safe havens within the school day. Unit Summary Children with physical disabilities and health impairments are those who have problems with the structures and functioning of their bodies, and who have limitations on their body's well-being, respectively. There are many conditions that cause physical disabilities and health impairments. The causes may range from clear mechanical issues e.g. accidents to complex genetic matters. Many physical disabilities and health impairments are relatively easy to prevent. Even if the condition cannot be totally prevented, the disabling effects can be lessened. The primary system affected and the factors that give rise to the condition could be ways of classifying children with physical disabilities and health impairments. These children, in general, show one or more of the following signs or characteristics limited vitality or energy many school absences the need for physical accommodation to participate in school activities poor motor coordination frequent falls and speech difficulty to understand in a broad sense all physical disabilities and health impairments fall into four main categories. 1. Impairment of health and disease. 2. Neurological impairments. And 3. Musculoskeletal and accident-based problems. The health-related problems mainly include pervasive health problems that may exist for more than six months as most scholars agree. Some of health-related problems are TB, arthritis, asthma, leukemia, osteogenesis imperfecta, hoof aids cancer, brittle bones, etc. The most common neurological impairment encountered in the school is epilepsy. It is a disorder in which there is a tendency for recurrent seizures caused from spontaneous abnormal discharge of the electrical impulses of the brain. The frequency of seizures may vary from a single isolated incident to hundreds in a day. The other neurological impairment is cerebral palsy, a condition in which the person is unable to fully control movement or motor functions, spasticity, atathoid, ataxia, tremor, etc. This condition is a result of damage to certain areas of the brain during development. Occasionally, an individual will acquire cerebral palsy later in childhood. Acquired cerebral palsy is usually a consequence of brain damage resulting from accidents, brain infections, or child abuse. Teachers can help students with physical disabilities and health impairments by adapting the learning environment to their needs. They also have a responsibility to any exceptional child to create a supportive atmosphere one that fosters the child's acceptance 
by providing classmates with information about the student's condition. Thus, if there are children with physical disabilities and health impairments in your classroom, take the following tips for good be alert to signs of fatigue in the child. Find teaching materials that can be adapted to the physical needs of the student. Make sure that all areas of the room and school are accessible. Make sure that materials, leisure activities are within the reach of the students. Include activities each day that the student can accomplish from a wheelchair. Arrange post-emergency instructions and telephone numbers. Various environmental forces have impact on children with special needs. These forces include the family, the school and associated treatment programs and the larger society. Their impact changes as the child develops. The family may be more important in early years and society become more important in later years. Schools as part of environmental forces have great influence upon the developing child. They are centers for learning, which provide opportunities for the child to acquire knowledge and skills that will allow him or her adapt to the society as an adult. Besides, there are social training grounds, where children get opportunities to learn how to respond to adult requirements, to interact with peers, to form friendships and to learn how to work cooperatively with others. If situations deviate from this reality, developmental difficulties may occur even on children without any impairment. High-quality early interventions are designed to combat the factors that threaten child development. If learning begets learning, then interventions at younger ages have great potential to generate cumulative benefits. By altering a child's future developmental trajectory, even if only a portion of the detrimental consequences facing at-risk children in the school age years and in adulthood can be averted, the benefits from effective early intervention programs can be substantial general assessment strategies and techniques, as is evident in almost all educational institutions of our country, continuous assessments are what teachers employ in assessing and evaluating learners' achievements. For the use of general purpose, we propose the following as useful components in assessment practices. Dear Instructor, as is evident in previous units, it is better to use different continuous assessment tools and strategies in identifying the learner's capability to internalize the lessons. In doing so, the following may help you as the baseline for the assessment. Individual and group works valued and recorded to appreciate effort of the learners day by day. Evaluate the learners after completion of each sum sections in identifying whether they cultivate necessary awareness, attitudes and competencies towards children with physical or motor impairment and the health-related problems, their readiness to assist all, specifically those with physical and health-related problems wheelchaired those with TB and HIV slash AIDS in inclusive classrooms, the learner's competence slash effort to eliminate social and environmental barriers to child's education. Additionally, you may use attendance recording, recording individual and group assignments, case reports and presentations, recording of seminars and project works, Tests at the end of the unit, activity, propose some indoor and outdoor recreational activities in schools for children with physical disabilities.
Suppose the school arranged a panel discussion for the community on planning a health fair on the prevention of physical disabilities and health impairments. What topics ought to be included? Suppose you are assigned to participate in curriculum changes for children with physical disabilities and health impairments. What are the main areas that you suggest to be given attention? How can the community and government decrease the at-risk problems in your surroundings? Support your answer with appropriate evidence and relevant literature. Did you ever find a child with multiple disabilities in your area? If yes, how does the community perceive the situation, and what possible supportive environments are you suggest? Discuss in groups in detail.